book of Acts. I really like the book of Acts because it's like I said, it's talking about the early church and, and uh, when the Holy Spirit came and, and people really started coming to Christ. It, it's just a, uh, the book of Acts is actually a very encouraging book. <clears throat> you know, so as we're looking at this, I'm going to be moving along, we're going to be uh, at Acts chapter 2, picking it up at verse 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Okay, you take it Oh, I'm all upset. Oh, Okay, we're looking at uh, first. Uh, let's just review. Somebody want to read uh, 46 and 47 of chapter 2. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. That's such a, an encouraging thing there. And just like what uh, Dolores read, so they continued daily. We talked about this one accord in the temple. They actually uh, were in the temple courtyard this time because, uh, you know, the, the Pharisees and all didn't really want them in the temple, so they were in temple court, courtyard there, but they uh, they basically went from house to house, communicating and, and uh, worshiping together and uh, having communion. And again, as it says in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord was adding to the church daily. Okay? Because here they were doing God's work there. Okay? And Acts 2.47 sa says, that the Lord added to the church daily, such as is shown, as, as many were to be saved. Every day, more people were trusting the Lord Jesus as the promised deliverer. They believed that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. How do you think these people in Jerusalem heard and understood what Jesus, what Jesus had done for them? How did they? How did all these people get this? Because what the church was spreading the good news. Okay? And who's the church? The people, right. the people that are yeah, saved. saved. Okay? They were out spreading the good news. Okay? So I got to have a little footnote here. Well, I think those individuals were just like uh, ourselves. When we first accept Christ, we're so filled with joy, we want to tell other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, that's, yeah. I think that's why they... Uh, I'd say, you know, I was sharing that... Uh, they have speak. That's exactly right. Think about, you know, when you first got saved. Think about, you know, before you knew the Lord and then, you know, some may have gotten saved uh, as a young child. Uh, some, you know, I know myself, I got saved at 25 years old. And, you know, just like the Lord is saying, once I accepted the Lord, there was a joy. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was such an excitement. And, you know, uh, I was so excited, I think I was sharing with you as I was going around uh, handing out tracts and, and uh, putting them in people's mailboxes and you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> but I was going everywhere, and just, you know, I had no idea, I was just on fire for the Lord and excited. You know, come to the Lord. I remember going in bar rooms, sitting, you know, going in the bar room there and a the guy sitting on a stool with a beer. And he, hey brother, God loves you. Here, read this. <laughs> and it was, did I really go in there and do that? You know, but that was it. Like, you were like pumped up on fire for the Lord, you know? And I think in our, uh, uh, you know, us even as Christians now, we got to go back and go back to that time and revitalize ourselves just like the early church did. And the Lord just hit it. These people were getting saved, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the Bible tells us that people were continually added to the church. You know, the apostle says the apostles and believers were telling others the good news that sinners can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the responsibility for every believer. 
Okay, we should all be telling others about the Lord Jesus. We can do this anytime we are with unbelievers. You know, um, somebody want to read 2 Corinthians 5.20? These are, uh, what's the next one over here? After we're, after we're running these. <coughs> Second Corinthians five twenty. Second Corinthians five twenty. Okay, that that's a good one because <laughs> our bodies are tents. <laughs> I'll go to the right one. Okay. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. Amen. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Right. Hear what he said. In other words, we're ambassadors for Christ. Okay, and what's an ambassador? You know, someone that's a, a witness for. You see, we're ambassadors pleading through, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to, to God, be reconciled. The only way that we're reconciled to God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember as I always share? Um, is an unsaved person reconciled to God? No, he's an enemy of God. You have to be saved to be reconciled back to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, until you're saved, you're actually an enemy of God. And that's why that first what Cameron just read is talking about reconciling back to God. In other words, Jesus made the way by, of course, God in the flesh bringing himself down in the form of man to die on that cross for our sins. And, and, and um, how do we get saved? How do we get saved? Which one, a key word that we, that how we get saved? Through our, our faith. Our faith. It's through our faith. See, it's through our faith. Who gives us our faith? The Lord does. The Lord gives us our faith to have the faith. You know? Um, like it says in, um, you know, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. Yeah? Grace. What did we say grace was? I know Martha was here. She was here. <laughs> right. God's kindness to, to undeserving sinners. So it's God's grace through our faith. Through our faith, believing on what he did on that cross, right? And when, the, when we truly believe, automatically, what comes and lives in us? What comes and lives in us automatically? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit comes and lives back in us. Therefore, we are now reconciled back to God. See, and, you know... It's good for me to really explain this to you because if you're ever sharing your faith, this is kind of like people need to understand that. They have to understand it. You know, a person might say, uh, I'm not an enemy of God. I believe in God. You see what I'm saying? I'm not, I know he exists. I believe in God. See, but they don't understand until they trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, they're separated from God. You see, God loves them. You know, but they're still, they're, they have no fellowship with God until they come into Jesus Christ, you know. And what's the Bible say? It's not the Lord's will that any should perish. But does everybody get saved? No. Why? Because they make a choice, you know. That's why, you know, it says in John three sixteen. we all know that. You know, for God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then you have Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, now listen to this, and believe what? 
in your heart. Mm -hmm. That's a big one there. That's a, that's a good word. Believe, because you just said, people say, I believe that there's a God. I believe that. But that doesn't get you into heaven. Yeah. I've had so many people throughout the years say to me, I believe in God. Maybe not the way you do, but I believe in God, and I know he's there for me. They say all the stuff, and, you know, I talk to them about Jesus, and they know nothing about Jesus as Lord and Savior. But they'll tell me they know God. Of course, they, they are correct, because it tells us in Romans, all man knows there's a God. You know, that tells us that, that all man knows that there is a God. The problem is, they're in rebellion against God, and for them to acknowledge that they are a sinner comes not from themselves, because the Bible goes and tells us in John that men love darkness. They don't want to come to the light. So who draws us to the light? The Holy Spirit draws us to the light. So that's his grace at work. You see, I'm just kind of breaking it down so you can see all how it fits together. Because, you know, as you share your faith, one may ask you these questions and you want to be able to help them understand that it's through their faith and believing what Jesus did on the cross that he died and how many days later did he rise? Three days later he rose from the dead. And where is Christ right now? In heaven. At the right hand of the Father. Right. Doing what? Interceding for you and I. Now, who's, who's left on the earth? His Holy Spirit. See? He's in heaven, the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. His, the Trinity, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going out throughout the earth, drawing people to salvation. That's what's going on with that. Okay. I think pride holds a lot of people back from accepting Christ because people don't want to admit they've done wrong. They, right. in their own sight, they're good. I'm as good as whoever. Yeah, that, that's right, Dolores, because, um, uh, you know, Scripture, it, you know, the Bible's so awesome because it hits everything on the head. Uh, the Scripture says, uh, Jesus says, get the beam out of your own eye. You know, right there. So, you know, people always assume, unsaved people, it's true that, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. They'll always say, you know, or look at so-and-so. This is where our testimony has to be, you know, good. Look at so-and-so. I know he or she goes to church every week, and I saw them in the store the other day, and you should have seen what I saw them doing, and I heard them saying, I mean, really, the unsaved, they're ready, baby. They're ready to, you know, uh, nail you there, you know. But we're, we're humans. We're saved by grace. And we're never going to be perfect. But, again, back to the Lord's statement, unsaved people look at Christians as we're supposed to be perfect people. But we're not. But they'll use that, you know. Oh, well, I can't be perfect like you. Or you think... If you're so perfect, but I didn't say I was perfect. The only one who's perfect is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a wretched sinner, saved by his blood. But see, you know, that's why you have to have your fundamental basics with Scripture. Because, too, if you talk to somebody, they'll, you know, who's the deceiver? Satan is. And they'll try to use a person to twist things around to get you all confused. You see what I mean? That's, and he's... Who's the one of confusion? The enemy, once again. Okay, but again, the gospel's pretty basic out there, but again, just like the Lord's is saying, uh, it has to be Holy Spirit led because people within themselves think that they're pretty good people. No one really wants to acknowledge themselves as sinners. Okay, it says, many of the people who became part of the church in Jerusalem had been given the privilege of seeing Jesus firsthand. We have not yet seen him, but he has left, left us a record of his life and of the life he lives through his church. Somebody uh, read John chapter 20, 29 to 31. Go in your Bible for a moment. John chapter 20.
John chapter 20, 29 to 31. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet believe. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Amen. Thank God. Did you hear that? It says here back in 29, with kind of just read, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. You see, and that's again, the church of today. But, you know, look at it this way, though. As you walk with the Lord, he reveals himself. You know, see God every day. What are some ways we see God? What are some ways do we see God? I see him in sunrise, sunset. Amen. The sunrise, sunset. You see him in the moon, the stars. You look up at the sky and you know, that goes back to Romans. All man knows there's a God from creation. So we know this through what we see. But again, how um, he orchestrates events in your life. And how these divine appointments um, just happened. Uh, it was interesting. It seems like uh, <laughs> I have encounters many times at the uh, at the bank up there in uh, Saxon. This past week, just uh, uh, Angela and myself were up at the bank there and uh, uh, walked in the door there and coming out to the side and saw Bill, Bill Black in the bank. And got to talking with him and right there stopped and prayed with him, you know, uh, about Donnie there. You know, we just went and prayed and stuff. That was a divine appointment there. And, uh, uh, you know, sharing it, uh, how God's at work. So you see God in activity every day of our lives. We see God, you know. Uh, we may not physically see him, but we feel his presence. We see his activity on a daily basis in our lives. Again, as we're going through a struggle, you really pray. Uh, I've felt this many times. Uh, you ever feel that peace and that calmness just come over you after you really like pray? That's the spirit. That's God. Where it says in Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. And you feel the presence and you feel the calmness. That's God right there. So he does. He reveals himself so much to us in, in life here. Okay. Let me uh, continue on here. Okay. Many people who became part of the church in Jerusalem have been given the privilege of seeing Jesus firsthand. We have not yet seen him, but we, he has left us the record of his life, as I just read. 2,000 years have passed. The church is still alive. We have the joy of being part of it. Let's rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for us. He has given us these privileges and we can thank him as we gather and learn his word, as we enjoy fellowship with believers, as we are reminded of his death by eating of, his Lord's, of, of the Lord's Supper, as we continue in prayer, as we help each other, as we witness to each other, as we're there for one another, we see the activity of God. That's pretty awesome there. Okay, I have a few questions here as I go into my next section here. Who reminded the apostles of all Jesus taught them while he was on earth? Who reminded the apostles? Who came and reminded the apostles? Who came and reminded the apostles of what was going on? And who revealed more to the apostles? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit right? The Holy Spirit. You have to remember, the disciples were with Jesus for how long? Three years. Three years. But yet we talked about this before. They didn't really still understand everything of Jesus. Jesus even said to them, I've been with you so long and you still don't understand. Why didn't they understand? 
because they didn't have the Holy Spirit to reveal to them. This is why simple as, as saving faith is, accepting Jesus as Lord, realizing that he died on the cross, rose on the third day, right? As simple as that may sound to you and I, to an unsaved person, they can't comprehend that. That simple little thing there, they cannot comprehend unless the Lord is drawing them through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's the disciples were with Jesus for three years and still they didn't understand. But what happened? On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon them and now they had insight. And now they were now recalling the Holy Spirit gave them the remembrance to recall many of the things that Jesus had spoke to them about that they could not remember. It was all coming back. That's just like you and I, when we sit here and we really meditate upon a Bible verse and we ask the Spirit to reveal it, He'll help us understand it and it'll speak to us each in a personal way. You see? So the Spirit was revealing truth to the apostles. What else did the Holy Spirit teach his apostles? It says all the other things, which uh, basically I just said, Jesus wanted his children to know. So I basically answered that one already. To whom did the apostles teach all that they had been taught? They taught the church and to all those who trusted the Lord as their savior. So basically the apostles were teaching everybody and anybody. This is why thousands were coming and getting saved through this time. Okay. Well, even after they started to teach, people were amazed because they said, here they are, unearned men, ignorant men, but then yet they were able to proclaim the word of God. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's awesome. And that speaks to us. That verse speaks to us because that's telling you that, you know, God will reveal truth. You don't have to be a theologian. You know, God can call people to Bible college and, do, and that's a good thing and so forth. But, you know, God works in different ways to reveal his truths. You see what I mean? And the thing is, through the Holy Spirit, you know, just like he did, just like the Lord just said with the apostles, the Pharisees said, who are these uneducated men that speak like this? I could have just imagined. They, they must have really sounded like uh, PhD theologians out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> that uh, they, they knew the, the doctrine. And knew, but it wasn't them. It was the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus Christ living in and through him. Can he do the same thing to you and I? Absolutely. You know, he can reveal truths to us. You know? Do you have a question, Vicki? Look like you had a question. <laughs> Okay. All right. So he can reveal truth to us just as well. It says, how did he make it possible for us to know and understand and obey the teaching of Jesus? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided him meant to write down the life of Christ and the apostles teaching what now, now is called the New Testament. Okay. And see the apostles, you know, God used them to write, you know, you think of uh, Peter, first and second Peter. Uh, John. John wrote the book of John. Uh, first, second, third John. God used God. God used John to write Revelations. Book of Revelations here. You know, so, and these were ordinary men. It's, it's awesome. Okay. It says, what are the things which you, in the Jerusalem church did things, excuse me, what are the things which the Jerusalem church did Things which we too should do. They continued to fellowship with one another, which we do. They reminded the Lord's death by eating the bread. They had communion. They prayed together. They helped one another. What else did they do? How did they? How did they um, help one another? What are some? What are some of the ways? How did they back then? How was tithing done? How was tithing done back then? They didn't go around and take a collection, remember? How did they do that? What, what, if a person was in need, they gave. they gave. Some did what? Some would sell their merchandise 
in order to help them out. Okay? That's, but they made sure that no one was in need. They didn't take a collection how we do today. Just they made sure that everyone's needs were, were met. Okay? It was very close-knit. It was uh, church service, so to speak, was held in homes, so to speak, there. Okay? Um, we're going to move on. Okay. Peter and John were two fishermen who became the apostles of Jesus Christ. Okay, and I just went ahead of myself here a little bit too. Okay, the Holy Spirit used Peter and John to write some of the books of the Bible. He wrote, you know, they wrote 1st and 2nd Peter, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelations, which I just shared. Through Jesus was not physically present on earth, he was working powerfully in the apostles through the Holy Spirit. Somebody read Mark chapter 1, 16 to 20. Somebody feel free to read that. Mark, Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 16 to 20. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father at turn page. Okay, keep on. <clears throat> Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him, after Jesus at the time. Right. So, remember we talked about this? Jesus went and prayed for his disciples. How long did he pray? All night long, we talked about that. And what two words did Jesus just say here to the disciples? Follow me. Right. Follow me. Mm -hmm. Two words. And what did they do? They immediately dropped their nets, dropped everything they did. You know? And that goes out to us. Is Jesus saying to us, follow me? Yes, he is. Okay? What's... What, do you, what does Jesus actually want us to do? Represent him. Right. Be or to follow him, but it's not in the steps that the disciples right. do. Right, exactly. But you got it right. Represent him and follow him by our character, conduct as a Christian, you know, and sharing of our faith. Okay? That's, that's the call to the Christians. We don't realize, as Christians, how people are watching our lives. They are. And they are. They, people watch to see how you react to anything that happens in your lifetime. Yeah. And they watch. Uh, they do, Dolores. That's so true. You know, you're being observed when you uh, don't realize it. I shared with you uh, when I lived back in New Jersey. I think I, I shared this. I had a couple of these situations, but um, uh, I went to a different service. An early morning uh, service, and um, uh, at 10:30, quarter 11, my car was back in my parking spot there, and my neighbor called me and said, "Didn't you go to church today?" <laughs> and I actually had to explain I went to an early service. <laughs> so he questioned me, "Didn't you? I see your car there. Is everything okay? You didn't go today?" I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I just came back a little bit ago. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they are, they're watching. He went this today. He's not going, he's not going, you know? So, you know, uh, that's it. And even um, uh, living in Lancaster, you know, I had a church plant and we were um, uh, coming out of a building and we actually, I was renting a Mennonite church and having church services 
one in the afternoon. And so my neighbors would still see our vehicles there 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. They say, he's a pastor, what's going on? You know, he's home every Sunday. <laughs> you know? But here, we weren't having service till one in the afternoon. These people had no idea that I was, they feel, oh well, he didn't go, he don't go to church no more, now he's just out for the afternoon. <laughs> You know, so, and once again, I had to explain myself, you know, that, you know, well, you know, we're, uh, they finish out, we're uh, running space out of the Mennonite church, and they're finished at 12, so we have our service at 1, so, you know, I had to go through the whole itinerary with, with my neighbor to help them understand, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm there, yeah, we're doing all right, you know, but the Lord is right, you know, you're being observed there, uh, definitely are there. Okay, we're going we're gonna to read a little things here. Jesus, Jews and Christians were still worshiping God at the temple. Okay, the temple at this time was called Herod's Temple because it was built by Herod as a favor to the Jews. It was later destroyed in 70 AD and the temple furnishings were taken away. The Jews were still continuing to go to the temple to worship. They were doing this in spite of the fact that God had torn the veil in the temple from top to bottom. When Jesus died, God tore the curtain to show that there was no need for animal sacrifices. Remember we talked about that? No more need for animal sacrifices. <clears throat> Through the blood of the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, the way to God had been open for all. The Bible doesn't tell us what the priest did about the ripped curtain. Okay, but it was torn from top to bottom. The Jews, Jewish leaders had great majority of Jews still did not believe that Jesus was long promised to live her. Let's read, uh, somebody want to read Luke 23, 45. Somebody read Luke 23, 45. Luke 23, 45. The sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. How far did I go? 45, 23, 45. Okay, that was that. Read that one more time, Pastor. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Right, amen. Okay, now go to Hebrews 10, 14 to 18. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 14 to 18. Fourteen to eighteen of Hebrews chapter ten. Anybody can read that. Hebrews chapter 10, 14 to 18. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Praise God. Yeah, that's good. Hear that? So that's the Holy Spirit coming down upon us. And again, I like what he read, that to remember your sins no more. So see, when we repent, we ask for forgiveness of our sins. Uh, we know First John 1, 9, right? What's it say, anybody? If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just does it. And cleanses from all righteousness. Right, so, and he remembers it no more. And again, this is referring to no more animal sacrifices are needed. Are needed. <clears throat> it says here, <clears throat> the 
People did not believe that God, yeah, they didn't believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead, many of these Jewish people. They continued to go to the temple to offer animal sacrifices, which could never take away their sins. See, there were still people. And again, there are still Jewish people that are, that are saved today. There are many of them that are. There are many of them that still aren't saved. But there are many that are uh, coming to know the Lord as their Savior. Okay? Even the apostles and Christians continue to go to the temple to pray, but they meet separately in the temple courtyard to worship God. In other words, they just meet in the courtyard there, not basically in the temple there anymore there. Okay, we're going to move on to chapter 3 in Acts. Somebody want to read chapter 3, verse 1. By the power of Jesus Christ, the lame man was healed. Luke tells a, mir a miracle which the Lord Jesus did through Peter. See, this was the lame man. Okay? And then we're going to read, uh, somebody want to read verses 2 to 5 out of chapter 3. Yeah, down to verse 5. Yeah. Okay. What do you think Peter and John would give this man? Okay, food, money, clothes? No. This is what Peter said. We go in Acts 3, 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Could you imagine that? That's phenomenal. He said, in other words, I can't give you money, I can't give you clothing, I can't give you any material thing, but I'm going to do better than that. You're going to get up and you're going to walk. God, could you, uh, praise God, could you imagine that? And then the, the man, Peter told the man to stand up in the name of Jesus Christ and walk. Nazareth was the hometown of Jesus when he lived in Galilee. Okay, uh, somebody read Matthew 2, 23, cross-reference to this. Matthew 2, 23, somebody want to read that. in the city of Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by prophets he shall be called a Nazarene right thank you yeah, Nazareth was Jesus' hometown when he lived in Galilee even the people who did not trust in Jesus as deliverer knew that Jesus and Nazareth had been crucified but you know you go back to this for a moment the disciples uh, you know Peter told this man to stand up and walk in the name of Jesus is God still doing miracles today? Sure. Okay. What did you say? Sure. Yeah, sure he is. What's what's a miracle that happening that happens in our day and age? It's spiritual. It is. Salvation. When a person gets saved, is that not a miracle? Because what? They're not the same person anymore. You know, uh, a person could be an alcoholic, a drug addict, really wiped out the drugs and truly accept Jesus Christ. And what's the Bible say that he is? A 
a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It's a new creation in Christ Jesus. I've, se I've seen it myself. Uh, I've shared this with you. Uh, he's actually a really good friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for many, many years. Uh, and he was an alcoholic. I mean, this guy was the worst of the worst. And um, I had the privilege one year, of, uh, many years back, of leading him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you want to talk about a miracle? I saw the miracle before my eyes. To this day, he loves the Lord. This fellow ended up being one of my supporters for 15 years, giving to our mission work. And come out of it, new creation in Christ Jesus. So God is doing miracles today. And also, too, you know, there are people physically that things are happening too. There are cases where people have come out of not having cancer anymore. You know, there are situations will that occur. And then situations will, it won't occur. You know, and God has a reason for that. You know, uh, I think of, um, you probably all know Johnny Erickson Tata, the quadriplegic, you know her, Patty? Yes. I mean, she speaks to thousands and thousands of people on a platform. I mean, she's got a radio, I listen to her on the radio. She, she was 17 years old and dove into the water that was like only three or four feet deep and hit her head and was paralyzed from the time of 17 years old. God didn't physically heal her, but he spiritually made her a giant in the faith. She's, I love to hear her. I'm telling you something. You feeling down and blue? You listen to Johnny Erickson. You know what I mean? Quadriplegia that can't move her hands or arms, has to be fed, has to be taken care of 24-7. Loves Jesus Christ. Loves the Lord. You see? And, of course, when she gets to heaven, she's going to have that perfect body. But, Right now on planet Earth, she's a quadriplegic, but she has, has spoke to thousands upon thousands of people in stadiums everywhere around, and many people have come to Lord Jesus Christ through her. So see, God had a plan, and he gave her the grace to be able to endure. And, and you hear her. She, she has her moments, but... She loves the Lord and she's content. This woman is content in the life that she has. That's from God. That's miracle right there. You see? So God allows that for us to step back and look at, you know, we think we have a bed to a degree. Let me show you something. Puts it out for us there. So there are... Here's miracles. Now that's a spiritual miracle going on. She's physically don't have her limbs that are mobile, but she's she God has done a miracle in her life, and she's being used as an ultimate ultimate vessel. Think about this. If God would have healed her, many of the thousands may not have come to Christ through that because she would have just been a regular, normal, everyday person. But because of her condition, her faith, people see her faith and they want to come to Christ looking at her. You see what I mean? So, but again, God is still doing miracles to this day. And again, there are cases where you see, um, we've been praying, many of you know uh, uh, Jane Gibson, you know, who has the cancer, young boy. Uh, just heard that his Cancer is in submission. I mean, praise God. I mean, praise the Lord. It's a young 18-year-old boy. Yeah, you know, and Alicia contact me and share with Praise the Lord for that. That's that's God doing that. See, so you know, uh, some he heals all. But it may not just be physical, it's become spiritual, but there's healings. You have to understand where I'm going with that. 
it's in a spiritual understanding there, but he, 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 you know, because he wants the best for us and he has a purpose designed particularly for each one of us, you know, to be used in the lives of other people. And he's working in our lives through different encounters, through different uh, situations. It also works like this, too. As I continue here with this, we got a little bit more time. How can you help someone many times if you don't really understand what they're going through? You really can't. You know? You know, uh, you know if, you had a, if you never had a spouse that passed away, you really don't understand a person who's lost a spouse. He could say, I'll pray for you, but I really, you, you can't say I know what you're going through because you don't. But if you've gone through that, you could come up alongside of them, hug them, hold them, pray for them. I know what you've gone through. I went through it two years ago. God's going to help you just like he helped me. And this thing, you know. Uh, I know what it's like to use a, lose a parent at a young age. I lost my father. I was 17. And I've been able to, God has used me in the lives of young people that lost a parent. Because I understand what that's all about. You know, but I remember going into prisons and, and uh, you know, uh, talking with inmates. But I would tell them, look, I don't know 100% what you're going through in here because I praise God, I was never incarcerated, you know. So I pray for you. I pray for your salvation. I pray that you, you, you get your life turned around and you come out. But I don't understand what it is to be locked in a cell every day. You know what I mean? Because... And I never was there, praise God. So that's why I say sometimes many of these guys they get out, they get saved, they can really be used as tools in the system because, you know, they've been there, did it? You know, but, you know, I just brought up the question about miracles, but God is. God is still alive and active, you know, and, and still doing things. And the greatest miracle is, again, the new birth of a person when they come to Jesus Christ. You know, a miracle when a baby's, a little baby's born. That is a miracle of life, how that happens. A miracle, again, of the new birth that we have as Christians. So God is still doing miracles in our lives here. Okay, let's read um, chapter 3. Somebody read 7 and 8. Okay, this is talking to continue about the, uh, the man here. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaped up, so he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Wow. Could you imagine this? This, this man could have been crippled from birth, we don't really know, but um, but uh, his bones immediately began to be strong, and the Bible tells us that, uh, I like that, leaping up. So in other words, it's almost uh, like he jumped. This guy was so excited, he jumped up, he leaped up, you know, and was, was, was healed. Praise the Lord. By the power of Jesus Christ, the man was completely healed, and was instantly strong enough to walk and jump. See, so to walk and jump up. Okay. And then we go to, we'll finish up with um, 9 to 11. Somebody want to read that? And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he that sat at the alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled and wondered with and amazement at which he had happened unto them. And as the lame man, which was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in a porch that was called Solomon's Greatly Wondering. Wow. Praise God. Many Jews were in the temple that day. They recognized... They recognized this man who was leaping for joy as the man 
who had sat begging year after year at the temple gate. In other words, this was a poor beggar man that was crippled that, that begged every year at this temple gate. And now here, Peter comes along and there he is and tells him in the name of Jesus. Okay, accusation I have here. Jesus had promised that when the Holy Spirit came to live in the apostles and all the believers, they would be witnesses. Okay, they would tell others about his life, death, and resurrection and the position of glory with God the Father in heaven. After the lame man was healed, all the people of the temple crowded around Peter and John. This was a good opportunity for them to witness about Jesus. Turn to Acts 1.8. Somebody want to read that. See, so see what happened? God allowed this because then they all crowded around and they were able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll close it off with Acts 1.8. Somebody want to read that. But you will receive the power Thank you, Cameron. You hear that? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. In other words, who gives us the power? God, God, and it's the Holy Spirit gives us the power. The Holy Spirit will give you the boldness. If you pray, Lord, guide me to someone to share my faith. Guide me even, give me the words to say. I will tell you this. The Spirit of God will give you the words to say. You know, what's that one I, I always share many times? First uh, Timothy 1, 7. But God has not given us the spirit of fear. Many of us don't, don't share our faith because we have a fear. The fear basically would be of embarrassment, not knowing enough, being ridiculed, things of this nature. But when we understand Christ, we understand that we have the, the power through the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be bold because we have Jesus living on the inside of us. And it won't be our words, it's Jesus's. And just as I'll close here, we're kind of ready. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And that's what we are to do. And just like it says here, this was through that situation, that opened up the door now that they were able to share the gospel. And just like any situation in your life as you share as a testimony of what you're going through and how you're trusting Christ, God will use it for you to share that with somebody else who could possibly get saved through your situation. That's how he wants to work in and through us. Let's close in prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you tonight for those who came out to Bible study, Lord God. Father, we know that you are still doing miracles in the lives of your people, Lord. Every time one gets saved, Lord, that is a miracle. There's a miracle of physical births. There's a miracle of spiritual births. Uh, we see healings and we see people that are not healed, but their faith is so strong, Father God. And that's there to teach us something. And Father, we praise and we thank you for this study tonight. I thank you for those who came out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.